Good morning and welcome to Snag Golf. My name is Terry Anton. I'm the Snag Daddy. This is Dr. Vanessa Hardbarger. We are at Northeastern State University in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Today we're going to talk about the various components of Snag. We're going to talk about the equipment, basic instruction, the training tools, the Snag coaching system, and methods of teaching. So stay with us as we get started. Now we're going to talk about the snag equipment. First club I'm going to talk about is the launcher. The launcher will be used for the chip shot, the pitch shot, and the launch. The components are very unique to this club. We have a five-sided grip that has yellow and red dots on it. And I'll go into how we properly hold and why those are significant shortly. On the face, which is oversized, we have the scoring lines, which are in blue, and then we have the large bullseye target on there, which again, you'll find out why that's important. The roller is, in golf, we call this a putter, and what this is used for is for a rolling station and when you get inside the green area on the course. This also has a bullseye target on both sides, so whether you're right or left-handed, it will work for you and has an aiming line on the top. It too has contrasting yellow and red dots on the grip and we will discuss how those are utilized shortly. We also have with Snag a very special ball that's slightly oversized. It has a black dot on the rear and it also has an arrow for aiming on the top of it. We always place the ball so when you look down at it you see the black dot facing away from your target. We play every time in snag, except at the rolling portion of the game, from a launch pad. And a launch pad is just like this, it has a T in the center, and what we do is we place the ball on it for each of the shots other than the roll, so it sits like this. What's unique about the launch pad is it has a directional arrow on it as well. So when you go to play your shot, you're able to know exactly what direction you're going. Now we're going to talk about the targets. Now we're going to talk about the targets we use in snag. The first target we utilize for, for people are, is the Rollerama. The Rollerama will be used at both the rolling and the chipping stations. It has numbers on it anywhere ranging from 10 in the middle, which is a bullseye, and the bullseye is the exact same size as a golf putting cup. Then you have five points just to the side of it and two more points out to the, out to the end. We do this because no matter what shot the child makes, we give a positive reinforcement because they get points. The next target we're going to talk about is the bullseye target. This target is used at the pitching station. As you can see, we have a bullseye in the middle which says snag, and then we have point values that go anywhere from 10 through 60. These points are added up as the children pitch the ball to this target and the ball sticks like that. The next target is the flag sticky. The flag sticky will also be used at both the rolling and chipping stations as the children become more proficient with their strokes. It is also the target we use when the children go out to play. This will be in essence the same as a golf cup that we use in golf. So when a child rolls the ball up to this and it sticks, he is snagged out instead of holing out. These are the targets that we're using within the snag coaching system. Now we're going to talk about the training tools. The first training tool we're going to talk about is the roller brush. The roller brush will attach to the roller like so and be used at the rolling station to help the child develop their touch and the brushing motion that a proper stroke creates. From here, we're going to go to the next station for chipping, which is the launcher and its use with the snagomatic. The snagomatic will attach to the grip, like so, and after they make their proper hold, we'll teach them the proper stroke within the chip. From here, we're going to go to the pitching station and the use of the snagazoo. The snagazoo is like this 
And the object of this tool is help the student create the proper motion in the pitch. And to do that, they have to create an, an L shape back here. So in doing that, they would go just like this to create their L and get a positive auditory feedback that you just heard. And the last tool that we used is called a snapper. This is a visual device that will teach the children at the launching station all the motor skills necessary to launch the ball properly. They will go through a series of motor movement with this that will help them understand and feel the proper swing. So later we're going to demonstrate each one of these, but right now I just wanted to introduce you to the training tools. Let's go on to proper instruction. Now we're going to teach you the proper way to roll the ball. With your snag ball with the dot on the back facing towards the rear and the directional arrow on the top facing towards the target, we're going to place the ball down, like so. Next, we're going to get into our little imaginary clock hoop here. And this is important because the ball is going to be at the 6 o'clock position. When we stroke the ball, we're going to stroke back to 7 o'clock and then forward to the 5 o'clock. So it'll be easy for you to remember that your feet are at 6, you're going to stroke back to 7, and then stroke in towards your target to the 5 o'clock and hold it there. So the next thing we'll do is the proper hold for the roller. With your rear hand, hold the shaft band of the roller, with the head pointing up into the air. With your target hand, you're going to place it onto the grip, with your target thumb going onto the yellow dots. You're then going to slide your rear hand down and connect to your target hand with your rear hand. You're then going to place your rear thumb onto the red dots. Now we're ready for the proper setup. From this position, after you've made the proper hold, we're going to bow to the ball, like so. Our arms and club are going to form a relaxed Y here. So you want to be very relaxed. At this point in time, we're going to spread our feet like so, and our knees are slightly bent, and now we're ready for the proper stroke. Now remember, the ball's at 6 o'clock, we're going to stroke back to 7, and stroke towards the target to 5. So let's do that. 7 to 5. And that's the proper way to roll the ball. Now we're going to talk about the proper way to chip the ball. You're going to take your snag ball with the black dot facing to the rear, the directional arrow on top facing towards the target. We're going to place it onto our launch pad and adjust the arrow on the launch pad towards your target. Place the ball so you see that the arrow on top is also facing towards the target. Then we're going to get step into our clock hoop right here. We're going to, to properly hold it, we're going to take the shaft of the launcher with our rear hand, with the head pointing up into the air. We're going to place our target hand on the grip with the thumb on the corresponding yellow dots. We're going to slide our hand down and connect to the target hand with the rear hand and fold the thumb of the rear hand over onto the red dots. From this position, we're going to go into the proper uh, setup. The proper setup will include a long Y. And the long Y, as we bow to the ball and bend our knees, the whole object here is to create a straight line between our target arm and the shaft of the launcher. So with the proper hold on it, I'm going to take one small step with my target foot towards the target. From here, I'm creating that straight line towards the target. Now, the stroke will be 8 o'clock, stroke through to the 4 o'clock position. So the ball is at 6 o'clock, we're going to stroke back to the 8 o'clock, stroke through to 4 o'clock, just like this. And that's the proper way to chip the ball. Now we're going to properly pitch the ball. First thing we're going to do again is take the snag ball, place the back dot to the rear, 
the directional arrow on top towards our target. We're going to place it on top of our launch pad tee and adjust the launch pad to our target. Place the ball on top so that the arrow matches that on the launch pad. Then we're going to go for the proper hold. Inside our clock hoop, you're going to, with your rear hand, you're going to hold the shaft of the launcher by the shaft band with the head pointing up into the air. With your target hand, you're going to place it on the grip of the launcher and the target thumb is going to be on the yellow dots. You're going to slide your rear hand down and connect to your target hand, folding your rear thumb over onto the red dots. From this position, we're going to bow to the ball. Our feet are still together. We're going to take one small step with our target foot and one small step with our rear foot. Our knees are going to be slightly bent, just like this. We've got a relaxed Y between our arms and the shaft of the club. From this position, we're going to swing away to 9 o'clock, and then we're going to make an L with our target arm and the shaft of the launcher. From the 9 o'clock position, we're going to string through to the target and hold our Y at the 3 o'clock position. So here we go. From the 6 o'clock, we're going to swing back to the 9 o'clock. We're going to form our L with the target arm and the shaft. We're going to swing through and make contact to the 3 o'clock position and hold our Y. And the Y is going to be our arms and our shaft. And the proper position is the club face is pointing up into the air. So let's try that. From this position, we're going to swing back, make our L, swing through, and hold it. And that is the proper way to pitch the ball. Now we're going to teach you the proper way to launch the ball. With the snag ball and the black dot facing to the rear and the directional arrow on top facing towards the target, place it onto your launch pad and adjust your launch pad towards your target. Make sure that your arrow on top of the ball and on the launch pad are lined up the same. From there we're going to get into our directional clock hoop and with our feet together we're going to hold the launcher with the rear hand with the head pointing up into the air. With our target hand we're going to place our hand with our thumb of the target hand on the yellow dots. We're going to slide our rear hand down and connect to the target hand. We're going to fold the rear thumb over and place it onto the red dots. From this position, we'll go into the proper setup. We're going to bow to the ball and form a relaxed Y with our arms and the club shaft. We're going to take a step with the target foot and a step with the rear foot. We're going to have our knees slightly bent. From this position, we're going to go to the 9 o'clock. We're going to form our L again, only from here we're going to continue to the 10 o'clock position. From here, we're going to swing through, make contact with the ball, we're then, which is dotting our eye. From there, we're going to continue to the 3 o'clock position, reform our L on this side, and continue to the 2 o'clock position. So let's do that again. We're going to start at 6 o'clock, go to 9, form our L, continue to 10, swing through, dot our eye, continue to the 3 o'clock, reform our L, and finish at the 2 o'clock position. So let's try that. And that's the proper way to launch the ball. As part of basic instruction, we use letters and the clock to get our message across to the students. First thing we'll talk about will be the clock. If this hoop that I'm holding right now is a clock, then in front of me would be 12 o'clock, towards my feet would be 6 o'clock, over here would be 9 o'clock, and on this side would be 3 o'clock. We do this because not only do most people look at clocks in this direction, but we don't have that ability when we're teaching the children to hold the clock up like this all the time. 
So what we do is we take this clock and we rotate it to a horizontal position. Now 12 o'clock is right here touching me, 6 o'clock is away from me, 9 o'clock is here, and 3 o'clock is here. We place the clock on the ground like so, and then when the student is inside, they look down and the first thing they see down below them is 6 o'clock. To their rear side will be 9 o'clock and their target side will be 3 o'clock. In SNAG we don't utilize 12 at all because it's behind the student. So this is the basic way that we use a clock. 6 o'clock at the feet, 9 o'clock at the rear side, 3 o'clock at the target side. Those are the three main numbers or, or times on the clock that we utilize. The other thing we utilize in basic instruction is the English alphabet. And for the body setup, we use a capital A where the crest of the A is here under the chin and it goes down to each one of the feet that are properly spread apart. And that would be our A. The next thing that we use is the Y, and a relaxed Y is with the target and the rear arms forming with the shaft of the club when the hands are formed properly on the grip. And this is what we call a relaxed Y. A long Y is what we use during the chip shot when the shaft of the club is in a straight line with the uh, target arm, and the rear arm forms the, sh the shorter leg of the long Y, as you can see. We then do an L, as you remember in the pitch shot, we will do an L on that target. And the L will be in this direction right here. As you can see, the L is formed with the shaft and my target arm, just like so. That is the proper L. So when you see in your instruction 9L, this is the position we're speaking of. And when we call it about a target Y, is over in this direction. As you can see with my arm, my target arm and my rear arm with the shaft of the club, we're forming a Y over here. So we have 9L here in the pitch to 3Y on this side. And these are the letters of the alphabet that we use to help you form the right positions for your students. Now we're going to talk about the training tools. And the first tool we're going to talk about is the roller brush. The roller brush will be used at the roller station and its purpose is to help the student develop the feel and touch of brushing and stroking the, the, the stroke of the roll. And the proper way we're going to attach this is you attach the roller brush to the rear side of the head, pointing up in the air just like so. You clip the clips to it, and what you want is about a half an inch of bristle sticking below the sole of the roller head. From here, once you've done that, we're going to take our proper hold, which is to hold with the rear hand on the shaft band with the head and the bristles pointing up into the air. We're going to take our hold there. We're then going to put our target hand onto the grip of the roller, with our target thumb on the left on the yellow dots. With our right or rear hand, we're going to slide it down and connect to the target hand. From here, we're going to place our rear thumb on the red dots. Now we're ready for our setup. We're going to bow to the ball, bending our knees slightly. When you bring it down, what you're going to feel are the bristles of the brush and not the sole of the roller. What we're going to do here then is take a small step with our target foot and a small step with our rear foot. And remember, the ball with, imaginary ball right now would be at 6 o'clock and we're going to practice stroking back to 7 and stroking through to 5. And all we want to do is create a brushing sensation back and forth. So you're brushing your stroke back and forth, 7 to 5, back and forth. Once the student does this for a while, what you want to do is adjust the brush back downward so that it is just above the sole of the roller head. So when they go back down they'll see that the brush is there 
but what they will feel is the brushing motion. So again, you'd make your proper hold with the target hand on the left dots, uh, yellow dots, and the rear hand on and thumb on the red dots. Bow to the ball and practice brushing back and forth. And what happens is the student creates a slower, smoother stroke because of that bristle and brushing motion. And then what you want to have them do is practice not only with the bristles down, but the bristles up. And you want them rolling the ball towards the target, whether it's the rollerama or the flag sticky, until they develop a smooth stroke. And this is the purpose behind the roller brush. The next tool we're going to talk about is the snagomatic. Snagomatic, if you remember, looks somewhat like a clothes hanger. But what it does is help maintain the long Y during the chip shot. So to do this properly, what we're going to do is we're going to take our snag ball, place the black dot to the rear, and the directional arrow on top towards the target. Place it down onto your launch pad with the directional arrow on top pointing towards the target as well. From there, as we go to make our proper hold, we're going to, with our rear hand, we're going to hold the shaft band of the launcher with the head pointing up in the air. With our target hand, we're going to be holding on to initially to the snagomatic. What we're then going to do is place the snagomatic and the corresponding yellow and red sides onto the bottom of the grip, the part closest to the head and place it on the top so it sits properly. And the ridge on the top of the grip and the ridge inside of the snagomatic will fit perfectly. From here you'll see that there's some portion of the snagomatic that extends beyond the end of the grip. And that's a good thing. So what we're going to do is from here with our target hand we're going to place onto the left dots as we said properly. We're going to slide our rear hand down to the end of the tool and grip to where your fingers of your rear hand are almost touching the shaft. So you want to choke down to the end of the grip this way. From here what we want to do then in this position we're ready to make our setup for the proper chip. So we would bow to the ball, our feet together, and what you want to do is you want to maintain the portion of the tool that's hanging over the end of the club, you want to keep that on the inside part of your target forearm, pressing against that. So when we bow to the ball, you can see that the, it's up against that. We want to take our long, our step with our target foot, one step with our target foot, and as you can see, we've created a straight line between my target arm and the shaft of the launcher. From here, we would swing back to eight, dot our eye, make contact, and continue to four o'clock. We're going to stroke this just like we would roll a putt. So it's eight to four in a stroking motion. And as you can tell, my long wide does not break down because the tool keeps it up against my target arm. So let's try that. Eight to four towards our target. Like so. And this is the purpose for the snagomatic. The next tool we're going to talk about is the snagazoo. The snagazoo is used at the pitching station and its purpose is to create the proper L at the nine o'clock position. And what makes it unique is it has auditory feedback. So if you do it right, you hear the proper sound, which is which why we call it the snagazoo. So to do this properly, you're going to hold the snagazoo in the middle of the tool like so. You're, with your target hand, you're going to place it onto the grip with your target thumb on the yellow dots. You're going to slide your rear hand down and connect to your target hand with your rear hand and fold your rear thumb over to the red dots. From here, your feet are together. You're going to bow down to the ball. It's going to make a sound. You're going to make a small step with your target foot and then another small step with your rear foot and have your knees bent slightly. From here, we're going to go to the nine o'clock position and then make our L. 
If we do it properly, we're going to hear the snagazoo sound. And that typically will happen between 80 and 90 degrees if it'll do it right. But if the student does it wrong, like so, if he does like this, or he does like this, there's no sounds being made for doing it wrong. The only way he does it right is if he gets to 9 o'clock and makes his L properly. And this is the proper way to use the snagazoo. The next tool we're going to talk about is the snapper. The snapper is used at the launching station. This device was designed to teach all the motor skills necessary for the student to launch the ball properly. There are four things or four routines that we'll go through with this tool to help design the proper swing for that student. The first thing that we will do is with our feet together, we're going to hold the snag snapper by the shaft band. With our target hand, we're going to place it onto the grip with our target thumb on the yellow dots. With our rear hand, we're going to slide it down and connect to the target hand with our rear hand and fold over the rear thumb to the red dots. First thing we're going to do from this position is we're going to extend our arms up over our head and relax our arms and hands. With just our wrists, we're going to make big circles counterclockwise, just like so. So as big a circle as we can make and as fast a circle as you can make with just your wrist. You want the hinging of the wrist motion and you can see the circle made by the streamer on the snapper. The next thing we're going to do is extend the snapper in front of our body and we're going to make with our shoulders, our arms, and our hands as big a circles as we possibly can, just like so. And remember, keeping our feet together, all we're trying to do is use the upper body, arms, shoulders, and hands and making big circles counterclockwise. This is going to be the feel of what these muscles will do and these components will do during the actual swing. From here, we're going to extend in front and bow slightly with a relaxed Y, and we're going to teach the balance of going from the target side to the rear side, and then from the rear side to the target side. And how we're going to do that is we're going to touch knees. So with the target, we're going to move our feet with a step with our target foot, and then a step with our rear foot. We're going to swing our arms back, touch our knee to our knee, and swing forward just like so. Knee to knee, just like so, developing a rhythm. This doesn't have to be hard or fast, just so the student feels that when he goes to the rear side, the weight goes to the rear foot. When he swings towards the target, the weight comes back to the target foot. From here then, what we're going to do is learn why we call this the snapper. And what we're going to teach is how the hands will properly impact at the ball. So to do that, we have to create a popping motion with the hands. And to do that, we will pop like so. If you pop it properly, you will hear the sound. If the arms or the wrists aren't working properly, the student will swing through just like so, and there will be no sound made. So the proper motion is pop it as you're coming through. Pop it as you're coming through. Once the student has done this at the on-deck portion of their station, you want them to take the club and do the same thing above their head. The launcher above their head like so, then in front of their body like so, then touching knees just like so, back and forth, developing that rhythm just like this, and then popping it or going through the popping motion like so. And this is the proper way that we use the snapper. Today we're going to talk about the snag coaching system. We have set up the coaching system inside one of the gymnasiums at Northeastern State. The system consists of four components, rolling, chipping, pitching, and launching. Each one of these are set up in very distinct areas of the gym for safety reasons, and we'll discuss those later. But the first one we're going to talk about will be the rolling station. Here we are at the rolling station, and what we have here is set up for eight children, four on each side. On each side we have two on-deck circles, 
which have rollers with the roller brushes attached and the children that are on deck will be practicing their brushing stroke with a roller brush. Then we have two active stations where the children will be rolling towards the Rollerama target or the flag sticky target as they become more proficient. So we have four on this side, four on the opposite side. If you want to expand this at some point in time to more children, then you can place two children at the targets who will collect the balls from the target and roll them back to the children as they're practicing. And then you'll create a system or a time system of where the children will rotate after so many minutes from one position to the next. And this is how we have the roller station set up. Now we're at the chipping station. Again, what we have are four children on each side. We'll have two on deck here and here on this side, an active chipping station here and here, an active chipping station on the other side, on both sides, and two on deck stations in the rear as well. So we have four here and four here on eight. At the active station, we have the launch pad, the balls, the launcher, as well as the snagomatic training tool so they can practice their long Y as they're chipping. As they become more proficient, they'll go from the Rollerama target and they'll go to the flag sticky target. Now what we've done in each one of these stations, as well as not only just the chipping station, but rolling, pitching, and the launching stations, is we have a minimum of eight feet between the on-deck circles and the active areas. So we have to give eight feet in all directions to any child that holds a club. So keep that in mind, the minimum distance will be eight feet. So as we look at this, we've got four children here on this side, four children on the other side. If you want to expand this like we did with the rolling station, you can put one child on each side of the targets to roll balls back to the active chippers, and then with a timed uh, sequence, you want to rotate the children within this station until it's time to go to the next station. So with chipping, what we're practicing is to the roller ram target and then the bullseye, I mean the flag sticky target, and we will uh, teach them how to chip the ball properly. And that's what we're going to accomplish at the chipping station. Now we're at the pitching station. Again, we have eight children that will be participating at this station as we have it set up. We have four on-deck circles that have, each one has a snagazoo tool in it. And then we have four active pitching stations that will be pitching towards two bullseyes. Right here, these two active stations will be pitching to this bullseye target right here. And as we come over here, these two active stations will be pitching to this bullseye target here. So from here, we have, if you want to expand this, we can put children off to the side to collect any errant balls, but you do not put the children directly in line with the targets. That would not be safe. And as you can see here, we've set up our minimum safe zone of eight to 10 feet from any child swinging a club to where we have it set up from an active station to the practice station. So what you'll do is during this period of time, you'll set up a time sequence where you'll rotate the children from practicing with the snagazoo to those that are in the active station and they'll rotate and switch. And if you need more than the children who are collecting balls, you will work them into the rotation sequence. And this is how we have the pitching station set up. Here we have the launching station set up. As you can tell, it's a greater distance for the ball to travel from where we are at about half court or mid court on this, in this gymnasium to where the ball can travel to the opposing wall. So we have it set up where we have four stations set across that are active and four stations that are eight to 10 feet behind that in the hoop on deck circles that have the snapper tools. And the on deck students will be practicing the four positions with the snapper and from there they will come up and rotate and hit the balls towards the target that we'll have down here with the launcher. So we have four active here, four active here for eight. 
So the way we've set this up, we have four at rolling, four at, or eight at rolling, eight at chipping, eight at pitching, and eight here at the launching. So we could very easily put 32 children in here right now at each one of these stations. Now we want to time them once they're here to no more than 10 minutes per station. About eight minutes of activity for kids eight to 10 years old. And we want about two minutes to clean up, get all the balls the way they are, put everything back exactly where they found it, and be prepared to go to the next station. And Dr. Hardbarger will talk to you later about some of those issues on exactly how to do that effectively. But anyway, today you got a introduction as to how we set up the coaching system safely in the gym. And as you can tell, we have the balls going with the rolling station back and forth with small movement, back and forth with small movement in the chipping station. With pitching, we have the balls moving in an opposite direction from there. And as you can tell from launching, it goes away from me towards the wall. So none of the balls are being hit with any velocity towards any of the children. So this is a safe way that we feel it can be set up. All the stations have the minimum of eight feet in all directions where a club is being used. So this is a safe and effective way to set up your coaching system inside a gym. If you go outside, keep this same type of setup in mind because you'll have more, probably more area to use, but keep in mind ball flight and ball direction as well as the eight feet for your safety. If you keep those things in mind, you'll have a successful setup. We're gonna show you the contents of the coaching kit and the proper way to pack the bag. As you can see, we have a lot of Velcro. Inside here we have, on the top, we place our four flag sticky targets. Like so. We have our snag balls that are neatly packed in their bag down at the bottom. We have all 22 of the launchers and rollers that some are heads are up, some of the heads are down to balance the weight. We have the snagomatic training tools that we've placed here. And on each side, we neatly place two of the folded up rollaramas, two on this side and two on this side. On this side of the bag, behind the rollaramas, we have pouches to put the launch pads. We put four in each one of the pack in each one of the, the slots that are back there, and then place the rollaramas over those. So the weight is balanced on each side as well as top and bottom. So it makes it easy to maneuver around. The only thing that would have been placed in here that wasn't were the two um, bullseye targets, which we already inflated. But this is the proper way to store your gear when you're not using it. Safety is probably the most important section that we will talk about. When you have students in a small area swinging heavy equipment, the potential for injury certainly exists. However, we have some strategies to help you keep your students safe. First, pay particular attention to the setup of your playing area, whether you are indoors or outdoors. Proper setup is extremely important. Mr. Anton has already talked to you about the eight foot rule, but I will explain it further. When setting up your playing area, always make sure that there is eight feet of free space in all directions between all players holding equipment. In this diagram, we see all of the stations already set up. Look at the launching station. You see that there are four launching areas and four on-deck areas. There should be plenty of room for the students to launch with other students swinging the snapper behind them. Now look at the stations next to the launching station. You must make sure that there's plenty of room between these students also. Next, let's look at the actual setup of the stations. What you just saw in the diagram was a typical gym setup. However, depending on other variables such as how much space you have, which strokes and swings you are teaching, and the characteristics of the student, such as 
age, their skill level, and how many students you have, you may be setting up your space in different ways. In addition to the spacing between the students, you need to look at the direction the ball will be flying as the students make their strokes and their swings. In this diagram, we can see the direction the ball moves for each of the stations. Launching and pitching should always be in a direction that swings away from everyone else. In rolling and chipping, especially if you have a lot of students and need the extra stations, you can have students roll and chip toward a target facing other children. This is okay because they are softer shots and the targets are relatively close to the students. If you have a smaller class and you want to have each station face only away from all other stations, you could do this also. Just think safety first. If you need to, draw your own diagram to look at the ball directions, the spacing, and the student placement based on your own situation. Next, we will look at a couple of video clips of safety issues. How you take care of these situations falls under management strategies, which we will discuss in the next section. For right now, we just want to show you examples of behavior that are not allowed for safety reasons. Students should not be allowed to move outside of their station area. This is why we often use hula hoops, to give the students a visual of what their individual space looks like and where they are to stay. The only time they leave their space is if there is a station rotation or if the coach instructs them to for some other reason, such as to collect balls for their station. Students are often tempted to run after their balls, especially if they have already used all of the balls they had in their space. Students should not be allowed to randomly run after their balls in this situation. They could easily run through another playing area and be injured by a club, a ball, or other equipment. Remember that paying attention to station setup and how you teach the students to play within their areas is crucial to safety. The next section is effective teaching strategies. Let's look at these strategies because in addition to their other benefits, they can also help keep your students safe. Using effective teaching strategies will have many benefits for your program. First, your students will be on task. In other words, they are actively striving toward correctly learning and performing the objectives you have for the lesson. When students are on task, not only are they more effectively learning, but management problems are greatly reduced. We see using effective teaching strategies as being proactive as opposed to being reactive. In other words, we try to set up the situation in a way that keeps several of the things that can go wrong during your lessons from ever happening in the first place. This is as opposed to you reacting to or handling each situation as it occurs instead of beforehand, which would be proactive. Let's start with routines. Routines are procedures that you use to manage situations that occur frequently. Examples are how you start your class, how you stop your class to give them more information or feedback, how you rotate the students from station to station, and how you disperse or pick up the equipment. While you may use whatever signals work for you, today we're going to use a whistle for our signals. One whistle means stop what you're doing, lay down your equipment, and put your hands on your knees. As soon as your swing's over, lay it down and drop. And listen and be quiet. If you don't do it fast enough, I'll practice with you, okay, so that you'll understand. The reason we have the students lay down their equipment and put their hands on their knees is so that they won't be playing with the equipment while you, their coach, is speaking. The stop signal can be used in many ways. You can use it to stop the students to give the students feedback, whether it's positive or corrective or both. Or you can use it to stop them just to give them further instruction. Or you may want to use it to stop them so that they can move on to another activity. When I blow the whistle, what do you do? Very good. Drop down and drop your equipment. You did a really good job, but we're going to try it again. Another method we use is when I say go. You say, when I say go, you give them a task, and then you say go. For example, if you stop the class with one whistle, they have their hands on their knees, they're listening to you, and you say, when I say go, 
pick up the balls that you just hit, bring them back to your station, and begin your strokes again. Go. It is important that you give them a task to perform after they do whatever it is you ask them to do. In this case, it was go out and pick up your balls. If you just sent them out to pick up their balls, after they picked up their balls, what would they do? We know that some would finish picking up their balls faster than others, and those children would be standing there doing nothing. Sometimes then you have boredom and management problems. So we add, go pick up your balls and begin your strokes again. This makes them excited to go pick up their balls very quickly and start their skill practice again. Always make sure that you say go before they start their activity. If you don't, they may start running out to pick up their balls while you are still talking because they're excited to get started at their station again. The way you train them to do this is to have them practice. If they don't wait for the word go, start them over and have them do it again praising them as they go and when they get it right. Okay, the next thing is you don't do anything until I say go. And I'll say to you, when I say go, I would like for you to pick up your equipment, go out and gather up your balls that you used at your station, bring them and put them back, and then rotate to the next station, and then I'll say go. If I don't say go, then you don't, then you don't take off and leave. You listen to me until I say go. Has everybody got that? Let's practice. Sometimes students have to be trained to do this quickly without taking one more shot or running after the ball before they stop. If their equipment is on the ground and their hands are on their knees, then they should be able to concentrate on what you are saying. If the students don't stop quickly enough or correctly, have them practice doing it again. It is very important that the students practice the rotations. You did a really good job, but we're going to try it again. So when I say go, I'd like for you to go back and start making your strokes again at your stations. Go! Very good. Now, stay down for a minute. I want to say one thing. I had a couple of you, when I said to go back and start doing your strokes, you ran after balls instead. Right now we're not running after balls, okay? I'm going to give you a chance to do that in just a minute. Just for the safety of it, you can't run across stations to get balls, all right? When I say go, I'd like for you to pick up your clubs and begin your strokes again. Go. The next signal is the signal to rotate. There are many ways to do this, and we are going to show you two. First, we're going to use two whistles as the rotate signal. When you hear two whistles, that means you're going to rotate to the next station. All right, I'm going to place you guys in stations. Do you guys all know what clockwise is? Yeah. Okay, yeah. you're going to move this way. So that means if we're standing right here, you guys are going to move this way, okay? So if you're at rolling, you're going to move to chipping. At chipping, you're going to move to pitching. At pitching, you're going to move to launching. In the following clip, we will use one whistle to freeze, and when I say go, to rotate the students to the next station. Go. When I say go, gather your balls, bring them back to your station, and then move to the next station. Go. Next, we will show you how to use music as a rotation signal. You can pre-record music and quiet periods. Remember that different ages have different rates or time periods between the rotations. For example, the very young students will need short periods between the rotations because their attention spans are shorter. Let's say that you want a five-minute practice rotation 
with 15 seconds in between. And during that time, the students will pick up their balls, place them at their original station, and move on to the next station. So on tape or CD, you will take five minutes of music and 15 seconds of no music, and then five minutes of music and 15 seconds of no music. You would work the room then and monitor the students and let the music take care of the rotation changes. The students have to practice this to become efficient at it. And we want to look at a video clip now, and this shows an example of using music as a signal. of the routines that you can use. Be creative and use your own routines. Just remember to be consistent. Your signal should mean only one thing. For instance, if one whistle means stop, then don't use one whistle for something else. Or, on the other side of that, don't use multiple signals that mean stop. Getting out the equipment and putting the equipment up are also procedures that you will perform repeatedly. So you could have a routine for these tasks also. The children can help you pick up the equipment. They can be trained to properly pack the bag. This helps you as a coach time-wise, and it also teaches the children responsibility. They can pick up their own equipment, the equipment of their peers, and also they learn to responsibly take care of the equipment. The children we use today have never been exposed to SNAG, nor have they been exposed to any of the routines that we used. While we didn't do everything perfectly this first time, you can see that the students pick it up very quickly, and it makes your class much more structured. We hope that this video has been helpful to you. We felt that it was important that you visualize some of the strategies that we have in the SNAG training manual. We know that there's a lot of information here, However, if you study your manual and then put those strategies into practice and use the information that we've given you, we know that you will have a more successful SNAG program.